Welcome to the Move Freely podcast, where you will learn skills that help you move freely in every aspect of your life. This month's theme is on picking up the pieces. So in studio today, we've got Stuart Cole from Vertical Coaching. He is a certified recovery coach. Stuart, who are you and why are you with us on picking up the pieces? Hi, Courtney. I am, as you mentioned, a recovery coach. I've spent the last 12 to 14 years pretty much trying to sort my life out from a pretty strong drug addiction. And, you know, we've known each other for a little while. And I definitely have something to share. I'm trying to change the lives of other people through vertical coaching, through a worship in the sense of trail running and mountain running and trying to share my experience, my strength, and my hope with other people. Fantastic. So now a lot of you may be aware that the next three weeks themes for Huru Learn is picking up the pieces. So many of us are trying to pick up the pieces, especially following COVID. We've lost jobs. People have separated from each other, divorced. They've lost their loved ones. They've lost their businesses. And often in moments like this, life can feel quite hopeless. And as a result, we lack the energy and we lack the luster to get up every single day and try to actually make some big changes in our lives, necessary big changes to live a more fulfilled and happier life. So Stuart, thank you so much for coming in today. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. And so Stuart, you have had to pick up the pieces a lot in your life and perhaps you can just share with the listeners why it is that I'm interviewing you today on picking up the pieces why I see you as an expert on this topic you know I struggle I still struggle with with addiction addiction to to really hard hard drugs I'm currently part of the the AA fellowship and Mm -hmm. I have definitely in my life had some some real struggles and it has been very difficult to to kind of how would you say push on and to to keep on on going um, you know when I was younger I got started with with drugs overseas in in London and I, I flew back into rehab and I was 21 when that happened you know that was a time in my life where I should have been setting the foundations for for my adulthood and for my family. And, you know, as time went on, I, I learned more about myself and I learned more about why I did what I did. And, you know, that learning hasn't stopped. And a lot of people think that when they look at, at certain kind of, how would you say, shortcomings in one's life, things like addiction, things like certain struggles or challenges that people have, is they segment it. So at the age of 25, I stopped drinking and that was it. And that was a separate part of my life. You know, I've come to the understanding now that it's all kind of part of the journey. And and as my journey's kind of progressed, I've learned more about myself and especially the decisions that I make. And each time I've kind of, I won't say messed up, but I've had a kind of return back to to my symptoms of, of my disease, of, of my addiction, I've, I've, had to, I've had to move forward. I've had to move on because it's very, very easy to revert back to, to dysfunctionality and to revert back to that comfort zone that I knew kept me comfortable, kept me safe, kept me happy, kept me in control in a sense of the way that I was feeling. And, and to kind of break out of that was something that I had to do and and it wasn't any kind of therapy that did that. It wasn't any kind of support group. You know, often it was small little things that people would say to me um, or something that I, I would read. But it would definitely come, you know, in those, those dark nights of the soul or that moment in the shower where I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent. You know, I don't know how I'm going to fix this relationship. And then I put one foot in front of the other and I started applying what I've, what I've kind of learned over the years. And so today you are a recovery coach. 
And that obviously comes from your history having gone through recovery several times in terms of addiction. And that addiction was to drugs and alcohol or just mainly drugs? You know, it's, it's, Courtney, it's pretty much the same thing. You know, I'm just going to put it out there. Just, you know, maybe it'll give a little bit more scope to the listeners. But I was addicted to intravenous heroin use. Um, and it ended up with a methamphetamine and heroin intravenous use. And it was on a constant daily basis. And I really, really fell down to the very, very bottom of, of kind of the gutter in a sense. Um, to a very, very kind of low rock bottom. Yes. And when we were chatting earlier, you, which I really loved to hear, is you said, I've become an expert at starting my life over. So, you know, there's a, as I've mentioned, there's a lot of people that are starting their lives over, you know, in one of the myriad of ways that I mentioned earlier. So perhaps having been through this experience, you know, often, what are some of the tips that you can give to people when they feel like there's sort of no hope left or, you know, they just don't know how they're going to get up on this day and move forward? What kind of advice would you give to them? You know, of course, the, the first little bit of advice that, that I would give, there is one mitigating factor in this, um, and I would like to bring it up because it's definitely something that we can, we can talk about. But that is comorbid. So you've got problems like people losing their job. Um, you've got people that lose family members. When that is coupled with a psychiatric diagnosis like depression or anxiety, it makes it chemically a bit more difficult for the person to kind of put that foot forward. Um, so, so that being said, you know, if all things are equal, I mean, I have struggled a bit with that and I kind of have overcome it. But, you know, I would definitely recommend that if anybody is really, really struggling is, is, is to, first of all, rule that out. So go and see a very good clinical psychologist. Um, and generally what I have found for myself is to find one that, that isn't pro-medication, that is pro-holistic approach. Because generally what they will do, if there is no other kind of recourse or method for them to to kind of treat you, they will definitely recommend going to a psychiatrist for medication. Um, but that would, I would recommend from, from my point of view, that being the last resort. Um, but that being said, you know, once you've kind of ruled that out, then it, it's kind of a, a, a inner journey or an inner search. And attitude for me is everything. And, you know, I was sharing with you just now, but I read a book the one time by a, a psychiatrist, like I mentioned, called Viktor Frankl, who was a, a psychiatrist and a medical doctor who ended up in the concentration camps. And because he was a medical doctor and because of all the disease that they had there, they actually spared his life because he could treat the cholera and the typhoid and, and all of that that was in the concentration camps. But while he was there, because of his medical and psychiatric training, he, he had a lot of observation of people. And in the book, he writes about you know, certain things like if you saw somebody smoking a cigarette, you knew they had given up because cigarettes was currency for food. So if somebody was smoking a cigarette, you knew they had given up. You know, he spoke about saving little crumbs for lunchtime to eat. He also then, once he kind of uh, outlined the, the atrocity and the the major stress that people were going through, he began to look at the hope and the joy and what the people did in order to, to kind of overcome that moment because they were generally faced with death at the concentration camps and they, they knew this. So that moment between there and there, how did they hold on? And, you know, the, the book, which is called Man's Search for Meaning, led to a whole different, it's called the Third Viennese School of Psychology, Logotherapy. And a lot of people do use it. And the one quote in that book that really stands out to me is, he says, man's greatest freedom is his ability to choose his attitude in any given circumstance. And that, for me, I read it and... I kind of was interested, and but it was almost like mental, how would you say, it was just kind of 
mental messing around. You know, I would think about it, I would think, oh, that's great, that's wonderful. Then I was at this other center after I got transferred. Um, I was also sectioned by the court. And this center was a very, very tough center. It was a very, very hard center. And I kind of got caught doing something that I shouldn't have been doing. So I got sent to the punishment facility where, you know, they really, it was almost like boot camp from, from the army. And I remember we didn't sleep for, for quite a few days. And I was up one night and I just, uh, I was almost hallucinating. I was so tired. I had been working all day. I was, and I had all of this going on in my head. And I thought to myself, if this is what my reality is at the moment, how do I push on? And I remember it was late one night and I think I was on my back. I was doing bicycle kicks in the air and I, I wanted to give up. I just wanted to stop. I just thought, I, I can't do this anymore. I don't know if suicide is an option. Um, running away is an option. Um, going to go and use and just until basically I'm dead is an option. And the quote popped up in my head um, and it said, you can choose your attitude. So I decided to choose a positive attitude in that, in that circumstance. And the way that I did that was I thought to myself, you know what, you're not sleeping at the moment, but how many nights did, did your grandmother or your family not sleep because they didn't know what you were up to or, or my partner or my girlfriend, you know, like, so I kind of justified the suffering that was going on in the moment. Um, and then I had kind of the, the epiphany that suffering is, is something that is going to be part of life. Um, and I've read that in many, many books from M. Scott Peck, The Road Less Traveled, to you know, a lot of the, the Buddhist writings and the Buddhist teachings about suffering. And, you know, life is really, really hard. And comfort is something which is fantastic, but comfort is something that we can sacrifice in the short run you know, to, to have what we want in the long run. And I think in that moment, I, I had this epiphany and I had this transformation, this kind of internal locus of control kind of shifted from an external locus of control to an internal locus of control and self-efficacy started to, to play a major role um, yes. from that moment on in my life. You know, I have, I wouldn't say failed, but I have had a return, of, return to symptoms from, from that moment but something deep inside me shifted. The one thing that I found that I stopped doing was I actually stopped being a spoiled brass and I actually started thinking about other people's feelings. I stopped being so selfish in that moment. You know, it's interesting you say the mindset can be the shift. I had a, a moment, or in fact, a couple of moments during COVID where I just thought, you know, I was feeling a bit hopeless about life. I was a bit of a tough place. And I actually thought I'd love to just get into bed at four o'clock today and just not face the rest of this day. And I sat there and I thought, you know, there's no escaping this moment. There's no getting out of this. And often our most challenging moments are our biggest teachers. And I know that sounds cliched, but I'd had the same experience 10 years ago. I was experiencing something extremely challenging. And I realized then that those are some of your greatest growing moments. And so I say to myself in this moment, you know, this can either be something that crushes you or it can be something that is incredibly rewarding. So I sat down and I was like, I have to have a mindset change. And in fact, I've heard quotes from that book, Man's Search for Meaning. And I think a lot of the prisoners of war survived because their minds remained strong. And so I sat down and I said, okay, you know, what, what have been my biggest struggles now? What am I struggling with? And then I wrote down as many reasons as I could think of why those were actually benefits to me. And it was like a switch turned on in my mind, literally just from taking that time to sit down and rework how I perceived things and to change my mental approach to it, I completely flipped the switch. And it was like, you know, the, the mind is an incredible thing from being fatigued and low energy and lethargic. All of a sudden I had energy again to get up and to pursue these things. And so that, that search for meaning and purpose is incredibly powerful and necessary for our survival. And as you say, their life will be challenging, there will be struggles, you know, and I, I love what you said about 
we have to sacrifice comfort in the short term for comfort in the long term. And you're so right with that. You have to face those challenges every day. There is no way that we can live a comfortable life. Because if we constantly live a comfortable life, that comfortable life will become boring. Or that comfortable life will become hard. So in those moments where you just explained to us, where you found that it was a struggle to get up, what other resources did you pull on within yourself or even resources that people gave you, you know, whether it was knowledge or learning or teaching? Another big resource that I, that I, I use is, you know, I started the trail running thing. And what I've learned with that is the mind and the body are, are very in tune, you know, especially our synapses. And if you can teach your body that you can overcome, you're teaching your mind kind of a new neural pathway that you can, that you can overcome. You know, it's almost like CBT in yourself. What does CBT mean? Uh, uh, that's cognitive behavioral therapy. It's where you focus kind of on, on your self-talk inside your own head and you challenge your, your core belief system because our core belief systems are put together when we, when we're children, when we're young. And often I do have many, we have false beliefs. So I had major false beliefs, especially in myself that I couldn't overcome. Now I'm faced with this whole addiction thing and I keep telling myself that I'm, I'm going to be a failure. So I actually self-sabotage just before I, I reach a point of, of kind of being successful because I'm so used to failing. And, and that's kind of what the self-talk and the false belief is going on in my head. So, so with the running, that started to, to show me via using my body that I can, I can overcome. You know, eventually I started running 10Ks and I, it was amazing. And then I would enter a race and I would, you know, finish the race. And that feeling and my body knowing that it can overcome is kind of teaching my head and teaching those kind of neural pathways that I, you know, I can overcome. So, you know, that, that's another massive tool that, that I've learned is, is extremely beneficial. And that's why I called vertical coaching what I called it. Because vertical is your vertical gain in trail running and mountain running. Um, it's not so much about your distance, it is, but it's also about how much you can climb. And then obviously, you know, the higher you get in the mountain, it's, you know, reaching the peak and reaching the summit. But getting my body to do something, you know, that, that's what I would recommend, is, is getting your body to, to overcome something. You know, be it yoga, I've tried a bit of yoga, I've tried running is what works for me, it might not work for everybody else. But there is something definitely built into us as human beings that we show what we can do with our bodies and what we can overcome. Um, you know, recently this weekend, there was a race in America that I followed called the Moab 240, which is a 200-mile race. Now, 200 miles is, you know, 360 kilometers. And it's really, really hot there in America in those southern states especially in Moab um, and Lake Tahoe and Badwater and those kind of areas. And the guy that won it is a guy called David Goggins. Um, and he's a really, really motivational guy. And I've taken a lot from him. And he's also another person that actually wanted to give up in life. And he saw this running thing and he started doing it. And he entered a race. He got to, It was a 100-mile race. He got to mile 70 and he sat down, he was bleeding. He was literally bleeding and his shins were completely broken. And in that moment, he also decided that he's going to push through and he's going to finish this thing. And, you know, he started a whole new life just because he pushed through. And by pushing through physically, he taught himself that he can push through mentally. Um, and the two goes hand in hand. So, so that's another major thing that I can, I can definitely recommend. And I know that has helped me tremendously. So, and has kind of taught my, my brain. Would you say then to other people who are feeling like they need to pick up the pieces and they're lacking a bit of drive, that perhaps they need to find something, some small achievable tasks that slowly kind of build the momentum and build their morale that they can actually get up and they can actually put things together and do something well. So find a hobby or a creative outlet that perhaps they, they haven't been you know, visiting recently in their lives and start to 
start to build on those. And in fact, I, I liken this to goal setting. I'm a big believer in goal setting because that gives me purpose, you know, every day, every week, every month, every year. But what they say with goal setting is that, you know, you can have these major goals that kind of require to move mountains. And you just think, you know, this goal is so intimidatingly large that, in fact, I can't even get started on it. It's too much to deal with. But break down that monumental, seemingly impossible goal into minute, small goals. And you work from the top, you work backwards, and you work it down to you get to the point where you have to start with your first goal. And that is something that is small and achievable. And when you get to tick off that goal, you know, there's this feeling of success, this feeling of achievement, this feeling like, oh, I can actually do something positive. My life is not just about falling apart. I can actually rebuild it spoon by spoon, as I said, because how do you move a mountain? Spoon by spoon. So I'm a firm believer in goal setting and, you know, goal setting is all good and well. However, What I have found, especially with myself and in my own search, is, you know, you set those goals, you do a vision board, and you accomplish the task, and, you know, that's it. But to kind of remain in some sort of momentum where you grow, I heard about something called self-efficacy, which is, in positive psychology, a a concept that was developed by a guy called Albert Bandura. Um, And what it is, is how well one can execute courses of action required to deal with prospective situations. Um, So if anybody kind of is looking at accomplishing those little tasks and you break them down and you you manage to start seeing the value in yourself by accomplishing what you kind of set yourself out to do, you know, self-efficacy looks at experience, vicarious experience, social persuasion and physiological feedback. With self-efficacy, to change your behavior and your performance, so it's kind of your your behavior that you set out to do and your performance around that behavior is, you know, it's got all these different aspects, and the aspects are mastery performance, uh, vicarious experience. So you look at somebody like what I mentioned just now with that chap, David Goggins, and I saw and what he did so through a vicarious experience i kind of learned that i can also overcome Uh, verbal persuasion that's usually from somebody else the physical state so like i mentioned the running and then you know your your kind of emotional state self-efficacy is something that if anybody's going out and setting goals i really do recommend that you kind of read about self-efficacy and then set your goals Okay, and you spoke about cognitive behavioral therapy and that we've all got these conversations going on in our minds. And for many of us, we don't even realize, you know, the monster in our mind. And we also think we're the the only person in the world that's listening to this, this little nasty monster or gremlin that's in our mind telling us that we can't do things. When in actual fact, you know, everyone is combating that. But how would you advise people to combat that that voice how do we stop that little gremlin from telling us negative things and how do we start telling it to replace it with positive things you know courts the first thing is to become aware of the voice that can be the most difficult and you know when i approach clients and when i approach people it's quite difficult because i expect them to to be able to see that see that voice hear that voice and understand that voice and people often don't, you know, if you take the layman that hasn't really been through a struggle, been to kind of treatment centers, you know, had therapy and you pull them aside and you're like, what is that voice in your head telling you? What is yours? What's the self-talk going on in your head? They'll be like, I have no idea because that self-talk that's going on in their head is a pretty decent one. Um, you know, if they haven't kind of had any serious challenges or, or, or struggles that have, you know, prompted them to to seek help. So what I would Definitely recommend something that has helped me. And there was a book that I got hold of, got hold, got hold of the one time called Addiction, Mindfulness Based Addiction Recovery. And it introduced me to mindfulness. And I started doing things like mindful walking, 
mindful eating. You know, uh, I started integrating mindfulness in in my running. Uh, I started meditating in the evening, and that kind of enabled me to shut down and tune into exactly what was going on. You know, exactly what was going on in my body, and you know, often now my my supervisor for the recovery coaching, who I work quite closely with, he would say, well, where are you feeling that in your body? And in that moment, I've got to stop and I've got to think, okay, I'm feeling it in my gut. And that is the greatest tool to get hold of and to kind of overcome your your self-talk. I firmly believe that because it enables us to be present and really see what's going on. So... From what I know, I meditate myself. The idea behind meditation is that you're sort of learning to calm the mind, to choose the things that you allow to come into your mind. And so when you go through sort of mindfulness training, you're more able to choose the voices that you're letting come into your conscious brain versus the ones that you don't want to come in. So it's learning to train the brain yeah. through this mind of mindfulness. Because Courtney, the the biggest obstacle we've got as human beings is our subconscious mind. You know, it's that part of our mind that, that is extremely difficult to access. And that part of our subconscious mind, our subconscious mind is what influences our self-talk. You know, that tells us sometimes that we're not good enough. You know, and, and that's from learned experience over the years. You know, people may be telling us that we're not good enough and that kind of gets written into our our motherboard in a sense. And, you know, you can't access the motherboard directly, but you do things like prayer. Prayer is a good one that, that helps us connect to our subconscious mind. Uh, mindfulness and meditation is probably one of the biggest tools we can use to kind of get in tune with our subconscious mind. And you'll, you will hear it often mentioned, you know, especially in, in mindfulness and kind of Eastern philosophy is to align the head and the heart. You know, sometimes it feels like we're doing two different things. You know, why do I keep going out and, and, and drinking when I've got absolutely no money at the end of the month where my brain knows, my logical mind knows that I don't have a lot of money, but for some reason I can't help myself but go out and, and, and drink and waste my money. Um, and mindfulness and being present enables us to align those those two um, and and be able to kind of access both of them and try and use kind of the rational mind over the, the irrational mind. And, and, you know, in that book, Man's Search for Meaning, another quote was, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. Love that. So, you know, if we can't change what's going on, you know, we, we kind of forced to, to make that internal change. And Reynold Niebuhr, who was a, I think he was a, um, a writer or a poet, a Christian poet, he wrote the uh, Serenity Prayer, which is quite a long prayer, but they say it at the end of most of the AA and NA groups. And that says, to the God of, of whatever your understanding is, to grant you the serenity to accept the things that you cannot change and the courage to change the things I can. And, you know, it's an absolutely beautiful prayer if you if you read the whole prayer. And it's, you know, this, this avenue that you brought up is, is a really, really tough one. But I think in each and every person, there's that desperation. So if you want to change and you want to make a change and you want to overcome, I would recommend getting desperate. So getting out a pen and paper and saying, why do I want this? You know, like you, you mentioned that you went through when you wanted to go back to bed at three o'clock in the afternoon, which is pretty much probably relative and tantamount to me thinking, well, why don't I just stay on the street? You know, everything's relative. So somebody's situation and somebody's problem might be exactly the same as, as somebody else's. And, and that situation that you went through was very much relative to many of my situations. And getting desperate, I think, is the, you know, the, main, um, the main task here. You know, a lot of people enter addiction treatment because they, 
they go through what's called an intervention. So you'll get all the family members around and they would have written these long letters and that invokes a kind of emotional state. You know, it causes the person to, to become emotional. And when we become emotional, we become desperate. They'll, they'll never do this again. Or they'll, you know, they'll make a change. And, and in that moment, in that very moment, that person is being 100% genuine. That person is being 100% honest. They don't want to carry on using drugs. They don't want to carry on gambling. They don't want to carry on cheating on their wife. In that moment, they're fully aware of, of what their desperation is. And to hold on to that desperation is the important thing. So how do we never forget that feeling? Um, and that's something that I've constantly gone through on my journey in, in, in the past 12, 13, 14 years even, is I would enter treatment and I would have nothing. And I would, you know, I would promise myself that I'm going to do it this time and literally no pocket money. I would have to work in the kitchen to kind of put myself through the treatment center and to stay in a safe place and stay off the street. The moment then that I move to a new city and things are going well for me, I forget kind of, you know, where I came from. You know, I forget that I actually didn't have anything and I didn't even have a cell phone and I had to borrow clothes from people. And I li literally at one stage, I didn't have shoes. And, you know, now I've got like, four, like six pairs of different kind of trail running shoes. And I've got to constantly use all the different tools, you know, that, that, that we've mentioned today, you know, from the self-efficacy to the logotherapy with Viktor Frankl to mindfulness, to constantly remind myself that I need to be self-aware of where I've come from to try and remain desperate. So I think the answer to that would be to remain desperate. Take a picture of yourself, make a video, you know, get out a, a journal and really write down there. And it's something that you can kind of co go back to. So when you feel yourself slipping back into kind of your old ways in a sense, or your, your old behavior or your old comfort zone, to pull that out and to just remind yourself, you know, why why you've chosen to make a change. I suppose, you know, the, the desperation that you talk about, as you said, we have different varying degrees. You lying on the floor and me sort of being in bed, it's all relative to what we've experienced, right? But I suppose there's this, this acknowledgement. We can ascertain that, you know, if there's this need to change, we don't want to be like this anymore. That's that desperation you're talking about. I don't want to be this person anymore. I don't want to be in this place anymore. That's the desperation that we're talking about. And that desperation is the need to change, to not lead this type of life anymore or to not choose these decisions anymore. And I love what you've said about, you know, maybe even writing a little manifesto or, as you said, you take a picture. I'm a big believer in writing is, you know, gives the brain a way to, to order its thoughts. But I love the idea of writing down a personal manifesto that you review every single day. And this just brings me back to a story. An ex-boyfriend's father of mine came from a very poor family. And to start making a little bit of extra money, he used to wash the dogs in the neighborhood. And then from washing the dogs in the neighborhood, he bought newspapers. And he delivered those to people. And then from there, he went and he worked at a restaurant. He did so well in this restaurant, he started to manage the restaurant. The restaurant was actually a chain of restaurants. From there, he started to manage the chain of restaurants. From there, he was headhunted into hotel management. And from there, he grew to be the managing director of the hotel chain. And what he said to me was, Courtney, if you have any goals, if you have a four-year goal, write them down on key cards that you put into your wallet. And every single day, you look at those key cards, you pull them out, and you just visualize yourself in the moment having achieved that. And he said, you know, there's two things that will astound you here. First of all, those four-year goals, most of the time you will achieve within two years. The second thing is why that's happening is because these little key cards work as a map. And every day you review the map and you check, am I on point? Am I heading in the direction? Am I heading north instead of south? 
And so you can have this little manifesto that you pull out every day and you check, you know, am I going north or am I going south? And I love that, that, you know, you can kind of write a contract to yourself, but that it's that revision of that contract and using the tools of visualization, seeing yourself improving and growing that can really give some power and ritual or ceremony behind this need to change from a place of desperation. Inspiring story. And, and that's self-efficacy right there. That's the vicarious experience. You know, this chap has told you what he's been through and you know what he's been through. So it says something to you. It encourages you so much that you do it because you want to overcome like he kind of overcame. And, yes. you know, there's so many different kind of online YouTube videos that you can go and watch. And, and my favorite people at the moment is, I don't know if you've heard of Jordan Peterson. There's much wisdom in, in reading his book, The 12 Rules for Life. There's much wisdom in, in listening to his lectures online. You know, and, and the common theme that he puts out is to take responsibility for your life. You know, like stop blaming other people. And that is something that I had to do as well. You know, I was constantly blaming my my mother. Shame she passed away from alcoholism. Um, I was constantly blaming my stepfathers. And, you know, I had to stop and I had to say to myself, okay, well, up until the age of kind of eight, nine, ten years old, you, you weren't responsible. You know, you were a child. They were the parents. But now you're an adult, so that's their responsibility. You making the change in your life is now your responsibility. Um, and so to take responsibility for my life was was a very big thing. And when you mentioned what kind of what that you know that that father went through and and just kind of looking after the dogs and washing the dogs and and then you know moving up in, in his life, it's you know he kind of took responsibility. He said, "What can I do now?" You know. I can't kind of be responsible for COVID. I can't kind of be responsible for the situation at the moment. And, you know, we both went through that during COVID. We couldn't see people face to face. What were we going to do? We can't take responsibility for what's going on in the world at the moment. But what we can do is we can take responsibility for our attitude and what we're doing next. You know, so, and if somebody recommends that to you and they say, listen, well, you know, write a kind of manifesto put it in your wallet where you want to be in four years' time, you know, do that. Because taking responsibility requires an action. And th that for me is, is also pretty much key. Stuart, you've actually given us such beautiful content to work with here. So for those individuals who do feel like the, they've sort of shattered on the ground, whether it's in their whole life or aspects of their lives, there's a couple of tools that we've actually shared with you today, thanks to Stuart. And the first one that I can recall is mindfulness and meditation. Finding a book or finding a course, finding a short course, and first of all, learning how to be mindful, being aware of what you're putting into your body or the steps you're taking or whatever you're doing. And then the, the use of meditation. And there are many different types of meditation. I've heard so many people say, oh, I can't sit still for five minutes or I can't sit quietly or my mind runs or whatever it is. We can always come up with excuses, like Stuart said, but at some point you have to take action. If you want to change, if the desperation or the need to change is there, then you've got to take these little actions, these manageable steps. So to start meditating so that you are able to, I like to call it, discipline the thoughts that you allow to come into your mind. And then the other thing that you mentioned was starting a side hustle. So for you, it was a physical side hustle. You started to run and that was your way of realigning your self-beliefs by saying, you know what, I'm not a failure. I can actually achieve in something. So for those of you look for something you're passionate about or something you can do on the side and just start slowly. You don't have to achieve the stars or reach the stars initially. It's just small little manageable steps to build up your morale. But go back to things you love or find things that you love to do, not other people love to do, but you yourself. 
And then choosing your mindset. And how I managed to do this was I sat down and I wrote down what are the issues and what are the benefits of these? Because in life, there is always a balance. There is always a balance. What came to you, you will have lost something else in order to gain that. So once you understand that life works in this beautiful balance, what takes gives, you are able to actually choose your mindset and your response to situations in life. So to sit down and find out what the benefits of this hardship have been to you. And hopefully, like it was for me, it can be for you too, which is that switch that you flick that just suddenly reinvigorated me and gave me the motivation I needed to get up and pursue the things that I wanted to do. And to find meaning in your life. There is, for me, this is just a personal opinion. There is no life worth leading if it is not meaningful, if you're not pursuing something that is of meaning. And for me, that's service to people and it's service to animals. So find your meaning. And often we say, you know, this is my meaning in life. It's my kids or it's my husband. But Sometimes you may actually need more meaning than just that. And again, you've got to sit down and you've got to have some serious conversations with yourself or serious periods of silence where you're able to think, what is meaningful for me? Because without that, the desperation that you need to change doesn't exist because there's no point in achieving more if there's no meaning to that. And then finally, as Stuart said, take action. If you want to change, it starts with taking action. And that can be small, minute steps, but start with something. And a quote that my grandmother used to live, she just passed away in COVID. She was the age of 96. She said, just keep, thank you. It's, you know, she lived a full life. And her quote was, just keep on keeping on. And what she meant by that is when you have hardships in your life, just just do a little bit, even if it's not a lot, a lot, just get up and do something towards that. And some days you'll feel stronger than others. And other days you'll think, you know, I can only take one tiny step, but that one tiny step is more than having done nothing. So Stuart, I want to thank you for taking some time out to coach myself and the other people that will be listening to this. And well done on being able to get up, dust yourself off and pick up the pieces and rebuild something beautiful.